All right, all right. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to New Life Young Adults. Hey, if this is the first time that you're here, we're not going to ask you to identify yourself, but we just wanted you to know that we are glad you're here. Thank you. Welcome. (laughs) Welcome to you. Uh, We're really glad that you guys are here. We're going to spend some time here worshiping the Lord and in His Word as we continue in our series, It's Complicated. Uh, Just two things to remind you. Uh, Check out the the summer hangs that we have left. There's everything that's happening in the month of August. The Epic Game Night is on a Tuesday night, so it's just going to be all of us together. We're going to come up with a bunch of different things for us to do here in this room on Tuesday night. And then um, Elitch Gardens is coming up a week from Friday. Yes, it's going to be a good time. So the, the most important thing about that is tonight is the last day to register. So if you wanted to go to Elitch Gardens, now is the time to register. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to take that whole list of everyone who signed up. I'll buy the group tickets, and then uh, we'll have them here. We're going to meet at the church. We're going to carpool up to, uh, up to Elitch, and then we'll be back at the end of the day. That's August 13th. Also, a reminder, a whirly ball is free. And uh, there's still spots for that as well. So please sign up if you wanted to do that. I'm going to sign up for that. Shelby, you signed up for it. It's going to be a good time. So uh, we will do Whirly Ball. That's a Sunday night. And yeah, so that's, that's all I have for today. Let's, um, let's now focus our attention on the Lord as we worship Him. Friends, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be here with you. The psalmist says in Psalm 96, sing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth. And we sing to the Lord to praise his holy name, yeah? So let's lift our voices together and sing to the Lord a new song. We sing from the rising of the sun.
heart's desires to surrender what we are, to surrender what we have, so here we are. Sing this with me, you came to the world. Came to the world you created, trading your crown for a cross. You willingly died, your innocent life paid the cost. Status says nothing. The King of all kings came to serve, washing my feet, covering me with your love. Sing more of you. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, so.
time together. We have an awesome night tonight for you. We have Pastor Eddie and Christina coming up to preach for you. It's going to be awesome. But before that, go ahead and turn around, say hi to somebody, meet somebody new, and make someone feel welcome tonight. Go. Well, if you can believe it, our series, It's Complicated, is coming to a close pretty soon. It's kind of hard to believe. The summer's flown by, and it's also felt long at different times. But um, here's uh, one thing before we dive into tonight's topics. I wanted to um, invite you guys to kind of give me a little bit of feedback in form, feedback in form of a question, um, because, like I said, we're almost done with this series, and um, next week... I've kind of been praying about, like, should we talk about this? Should we talk about that? And so what I'd love is for you to help me figure out what we're going to be talking about next week by doing this. Um, You guys can throw it up on the screen. Just text your question. If there's anything that we haven't talked about that you'd love to hear talked about, uh, please text that in. It doesn't even have to be a question. It should just be like this topic or, you know, something about this area and relationships Um, I would love to hear from you guys. So we're going to give you a minute here. We're going to put the music back on, some house music on. Just take a minute. Anything that's, that, uh, that you wanted to hear about in the series and haven't yet, go ahead and text that in. Again, I can't, obviously I won't be able to talk about everything I get (laughs) texted about, but, um, hopefully that'll help us kind of guide, like maybe we should spend some time in this area. All right. So go ahead and turn the music on. You guys take a minute and text in some questions.
All right, you're not even texting questions, you're just texting each other now, I can tell. I can tell the difference, so we're gonna move on. Um, okay, uh, well first, please help me in joining the first lady of NLYA, Christina Hoagland, to the stage. <laughs> we're gonna be tag teaming it a bit tonight uh, because we just wanna have a heart to heart, really. This talk is called, um, here's the title, it's the journey toward marriage, and we're going to be talking about everything that leads up towards marriage and relationships. And uh, as we're approaching the end of the series, we want to transition to some practical guidance and um, less about rules and, you know, the Bible says this specifically, and more about wisdom, uh, because many of the things that have to do with relationships are around the topic of wisdom. You know, it's not go right or left, it's what's, it's not good or bad, it's good and what's better, what's best, and that, those are the kind of decisions that we're having to make. Some of the things we're going to be sharing tonight are things that Christina and I have walked through and we've experienced it personally, and so we wanted to offer some counsel to you as you navigate these complicated waters, and, uh, but first, we wanted to share more of our story so you guys get a bit more of the context of where we're coming from and the things that we've walked through. Uh, so yeah, Christina, why don't you share a bit of our story, and then I'll share a bit as well. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I wanted to share a little bit first about, um, like, just a little bit about me, so, because I don't get to get up here and share as much, so just so you have a little bit more context for me as well. Um, so I grew up um, actually in a military family. My dad graduated from the Air Force Academy here, um, so everybody that's here, we're glad you're here uh, from there, and um, so it's cool to be back in Colorado after that, but uh, so I moved, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff with the military life growing up. Um, and then I ended up at Liberty University for college, which is in um, Virginia, Christian school. Yeah, go Liberty. <laughs> um, and so um, one of the things I wanted to share about that is um, just how I came to know the Lord was when I was a sophomore at Liberty. Um, and I grew up in a Christian home. Both my parents are believers. And so when I went to a Christian university, um, in some ways it felt like a natural choice, but it, it wasn't really because there was a lot of my life that like pre that day, obviously I didn't really know the Lord, but I thought growing up in the church, like I thought I knew the truth, I would beat the door down to tell you that Jesus is the way and that the Bible is the truth. Like I never had a doubt about that, um, but I did not live what I said. So classic definition of what a hypocrite is. Um, so I lived a very hypocritical life, a lot of like, I'm in youth group saying one thing, and then my life behind closed doors was totally different. Um, and a lot of that had to do with relationships. Um, and so when I went to Liberty, my sophomore year, the campus pastor uh, was preaching that day about idolatry. Um, and he, you know, gave the definition of an idol, which is something that you give a lot of thought to, you put all your energy towards, you put highest priority on the list, you know, it trumps everything else in your life. Um, and so he was, you know, defining it and then was like, hey, I want you to, you know, take some time to like think about something that that could be for you. What would be something that you put all your time towards, all your energy, it would trump anything about the Lord, it would trump anything about, you know, scripture, anything. And it didn't take much for my mind to like think of something right away um, because like I said, a lot of my life, I had been prioritizing relationships um, at a very unhealthy level. And um, at that time, there was like a, one person in particular that had come to mind. And then the pastor said, is, I want you to think about that thing and then ask yourself, is that thing as good to you as God is? Um, which is a great question to ask. <laughs> and when I was, you know, putting those two things before my 
heart, before my mind, it was obvious very quickly that it doesn't, that guy didn't stand up. None of those things that I had made as idols stood up to how good the Lord is. Um, And I really, in that moment, it was like so much exactly what scripture talks about, where your, your eyes are opened, your, the scales on our eyes fall off. And in that moment, I saw so much the severity of my sin. I saw the severity of how I had lived. And um, I really felt the severity of like, man, I have claimed this faith. I have like preached this. I have said this to people. I have been that annoying person in public high school that's like, you know, the Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And yet I'm not living that. And this is, this is the point right here where the Lord brought me to the mat. And I just went down and just like cried at the altar of that arena. Um, and just, I remember like a puddle of tears <laughs> that I could like, man, I can like be there in this moment. And um, it was so real of just the Lord being like, that has to end now. I have to be everything. Um, and the reason I, I share that with you is because um, because relationships was a big part of my life before Christ of being a hindrance and a lot of a um, struggle and all of those things. Uh, when I came to know the Lord, uh, and by grace, by his grace, I was at a Christian university and surrounded by a lot of people that believe the same thing that I do. And, you know, we were t- learning a lot about relationships and all that. And the Lord made it very clear, like, you need to just take some time. You need to not be in a relationship. You need to figure this out, and just like scripture says, he was like, I wanna take some things out that are like super unhealthy, I wanna put some things in that are the things that are what I want for you. Um, And when he did that, he talked a lot about, the Lord put a lot on my heart about friendship. And being in a Christian school, (laughs) uh, it was also like, what do you mean by that? Because right now, like everybody wants to be your friend, you know, like classic, like let's be friends. And guys would be like, let's hang out, well, let's be friends. And then you like, they would be super ambiguous. You never knew where you stood. You're like, are we dating? Are we not dating? We're just friends. This is totally bogus. So I was like, Lord, what do you, what does that even mean? You know? <laughs> um, but he just, he really put heavy on my heart for a couple years when I wasn't dating. I want you to, when you get into a relationship, I want friendship to be a really big focus. And um, that was one of the greatest blessings when I met Eddie um, was that when we dated, um, we dated for a year before we kissed, before we said I love you, which was not what I would have picked if I had picked, you know, to be the leader of the relationship. And the Lord knew that's exactly what I needed, though, because Eddie was very good at pursuing, which is very biblical. He was very good at making it very clear that he liked me, that we were dating, that, like, this is the definition of our relationship but we spent a year just getting to know each other super, super well and developing true friendship, you know, hanging out on dates or hanging out with other people or whatever. And I, I cannot tell you 11 years later in our marriage the benefit that that still is today because we're friends. Like, we love hanging out together. We love to be around each other. We can communicate super well. And it's not perfect. There's so many things that the Lord has also done in 11 years but the friendship piece is, was just such a gift and I'm so thankful the Lord did that. Um, so I just tell you all of that kind of background so that you know where I came from. That's my dating history. That's you know how I came to know the Lord and, and then Eddie. And mine was a little bit different. <laughs> um, I, uh, I grew up in a family that decided that they weren't gonna allow us to date anyone until we left the house. So until you were 18, no dating at all. And uh, that was the rule and I was one of the few who followed the rule, I would say. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I didn't date anyone. And then I went to college, and when I was 18, even though I could date someone, with everything that was changing in my life when I was 18, I decided I'm just not gonna date anyone this year. I'll just put that on hold for now. And then when I came back from that summer break, I was like, maybe I'm gonna date this girl. And then I decided not to that fall. And then um, one of my, my friends from high school had transferred to the college, to Liberty, and uh, so I asked her out on a few dates, and then after the few dates, I was like, I don't think this is going anywhere, so I just told her that. I was like, I don't think this is going anywhere, so I don't think we need to go out on dates anymore. And uh, she, she was fine. Everything was fine. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, we're talking about clarity tonight. You guys don't even know. We're going yeah, to we're we're, we're gonna go there tonight. <laughs> um, and then, um, and then, uh, then I met Christina the fall of my junior year, so she's a couple years older than me, little known fact. 
And uh, she was a residence director, so that means she oversaw four of the women dorms there on campuses, on campus, and one of those dorms was my sister dorm, so we had like brother-sister dorm activities. So we went to this leadership event, and I got asked to like take a picture. Um, They're like, hey, can you take a picture with my phone? I was like, sure. And then in that picture was Christina, and then all these girls from her dorm. And I remember thinking, that woman is beautiful, and she's probably married and has kids. That's... <laughs> That's what went through my mind. That's true. That's true. And that's because Christina looked older then than she does now. Like this is a hundred. If we we have that picture, yeah, we have that picture too. She was trying to dress and look (laughs) older because she was the boss of people just like a year or two younger than her. Um, But uh, but I just that I just wrote it off. I was like, well, great for whoever she married, you know. And um, it wasn't until two months later that I was hanging out with one of our mutual friends, and she was like, no, Christina's single. Like. She's single, and, uh, and so then I went back to my dorm that night, and I told my roommate, I was like, Joey, she's single. Like, I have to do something about this. <laughs> and uh, so, so then began the process of figuring out how to ask this girl out, and we, because we had a mutual friend, what I did is I told that mutual friend, I was like, why don't you set it up so that I cook Mexican food for you and Christina and whoever else you want to invite, and uh, so we actually went to her apartment and I cooked a Mexican meal. And that was my way of just seeing her in a group of friends so I could hear her voice because I'd, I'd yet to talk to her, you know. And so I, was just, I just wanted to see what she was like in that setting. Then I had, you know, a few conversations in the hallway that were extremely awkward. And, very awkward. They were and very awkward. I was so frustrated with how awkward they were that I was like, that's it. I'm just going to ask her out. <laughs> and so I decided to ask her out. I go to, we had like this Christmas something event in December and in this we there's like an arena at Liberty where you do chapel and in the concourse of that arena Christina's walking by and literally there's no one else in the concourse I was like this is it like this is this is the gift from God this is my shot and so I walk up to her and I'm like hey how's it going more awkward conversation about Thanksgiving break or whatever and then and then I just choked like a hundred percent I was just like okay, see you later. Like, (laughs) I couldn't do it. (laughs) And uh, so then I go, like, take a final. And the rest of the day, I was just so mad at myself. I was like, what, you, like, come on, Eddie. Like, pep talk. I was like, you can do this. So then then I finished that final. And just two hours after I had botched it, I was like, that's it. I'm just going to have to go to her apartment, knock on the door, and ask her out. So I go to her apartment, and there's the door. And I kind of needed to, like, you know, there there was a little bit of a pep talk needed inside my head. So instead of waiting in front of the front door, because there's all these students walking around, I kind of like hid in the bushes, a little (laughs) little sketchy. Um, No one calls security on me, thankfully. And then after, like, I, you know, gave myself the pep talk, I was like, here we go. I knocked on the door. (laughs) She answered. And I was like, what, I don't even remember what I said, but it was pretty fast to the point. And I was like, blah, 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 blah. And then, hey, I'd like to take you out on a date would you go out with me? And she goes, can I think about it? (laughs) And I said, there's like a whole story there that we can tell another time. (laughs) There was like a very valid reason. Yeah, there was a good reason that she had to think about it. I wanted to say yes. But uh, then I was like, okay, you can think about it. How about till tomorrow, right? Establishing (laughs) timelines. I'm not just going to wait here for months. Cut off. Uh, and she was like, yeah, oh, yeah. And then the next day she was like, yeah, I'd love to go out with you. And that's how we started dating. We dated for a year. So like January, like December, January through the next January. And then we were engaged for three months and got married in May. We've been married 11 years and then we're here. So there it is. There's a summary <laughs> of our, oh, yes. Well <laughs> Thank you. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I, pre- <laughs> I appreciate it. So tonight is basically the equivalent of, let's say we're hanging out together and we're talking about dating and engagement specifically here tonight. And this is why I call it a heart to heart because these are the things we have shared with people. So all the things we're talking about tonight, they've been pieced together over the last 11 years of us spending time with our friends, with other people in church, and just giving as best counsel as we know to give in this topic. And that's why we're calling it the journey towards marriage. There's a journey that begins with dating and then hopefully gets towards engagement and then hopefully gets to marriage. um, That's the goal of the relationship. And so we wanted to start with just two points to share tonight. And uh, the first point we're going to be talking about is engagement because that's the last part of this journey. It's the last part right before you get married. 
And that's when you are engaged. Now, the Bible calls this uh, betrothal, and um, we know a lot about what happened during the engagement season of people's lives in biblical times because we have a lot of historical support from the Jewish culture of what that looked like. And if you've ever taken the time to study it, it's really awesome. There's a lot of beautiful imagery inside of it. But I will say there's nowhere in the Bible that's saying that that's how it's supposed to be happening with us inside of our culture here today in 2021. Um, Really, the Bible uh, doesn't give that specific instruction. The point the Bible does make about engagement is that we are to make sure that we're not falling into sexual sin during that time of engagement. That's really all the guidance the Bible gives. So it's like, what, you know, what are the steps? All that is wisdom, you know, asking for godly counsel. The only principle that really needs to be in place is making sure that we're fleeing sexual temptation during this season. And so that's the first point under this point that we wanted to uh, share is that we recommend shorter engagements when possible, when possible, okay? I don't know your life. I'm sure if you're like, look, we got a long engagement and there's this reason, this reason. I understand. There's definitely reasons why that's just not possible sometimes, but that's why we put it inside the, point, into, inside the point when possible. And we are recommending it. We're not saying this is a must, but because of all the reasons we're gonna be talking about here, we're recommending it be shorter because it only gets harder the longer it is. Engagement is not um, an easy season necessarily. Uh, the temptation will increase. You guys remember when we talked about um, fleeing sexual sin, how we talked about it needs to be the right person, the right time with the right motive. When you get engaged, you have now said, this person, I believe, is the right person. So take all the pressure from right person, and that just suddenly shifts over to right time. And everything is about the right time. That's all you're gonna be able to think about at that point. And so all the more reason why it's just not wise to just say, hey, we're gonna get engaged, and we have no idea when we desire to get married. I think you need to already be thinking about that before you propose, side note, like to be thinking, like when could that happen? Where do we see that happening? I had a very ambiguous conversation with Christina where we talked about like just big, you know, big picture, like if this happened, when would we get married? And that gave me enough confidence to be like, okay, now we can get engaged, because I knew I did not um, want a long engagement. Because um, if, if you prolong the engagement, and, um, and the temptation increases, and you do not run away from that temptation, because your job is not to resist it, your job is to run away from it, and if you don't run away from it, and you end up falling into sin with each other, man, the last thing you need to do is to start a marriage needing to go through a redemptive process. And this happens to so many people, and I don't want this for you, we don't want this for you. You don't wanna start marriage needing to go through the, re- re- you know, the process of repentance and restoration, all these things. Um, save yourself the pain. And, and that's why we recommend short engagements uh, to help you with that process. Song of Solomon is, uh, we could have done a whole study on the book of Song of Solomon, but uh, in, inside that book, you see this relationship between Solomon and this woman who he marries. And there's a, a phrase that gets repeated three times in the book that's always stood out to me. And it starts in uh, Song of Solomon chapter two, verse seven, where this is the wife speaking, or wife to be at this point in the book. I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, O daughters of Jerusalem, referring to her friends. Hey, everybody, listen up. This is what I want to say. By the gazelles or the does of the field, you have to remember Song of Solomon is poetry. (laughs) So what she's saying is, for the love of everything that is beautiful in the world, hear me, okay? She's, She's bringing emphasis to what she's about to say, and that is that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases that you not stir up or awaken love until it pleases. While you're in the engagement process, you have to be so aware of the fact that your temptation is to awaken love until before it pleases. What pleases, that's referring to marriage. Why is it that when it pleases is because that's when it's pleasing to the Lord that you can now awaken full physical intimacy and it's pleasing to God. It's a beautiful thing. God created it and he said, let the marriage bed not be defiled. Let it be undefiled. It's something awesome that he made as we've talked about before. So there's Song of Solomon, but then also you have 1 Corinthians chapter seven. Why don't you share that verse, babe? Yes, 1 Corinthians 7, 9 says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. 
And remember, we talked about this last week about how Paul is giving the exhortation um, that it's, it's better to be single. You can live in undivided devotion to the Lord. You know, he's making that case. And then he gets to this point and he says, um, but if you, if you can't, if you can't exercise self-control, then you should marry. Um, and I think it's really interesting, just the phrasing there, that he says, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. And the thing that I thought about when I read that part of the verse especially is that it's our personal responsibility when we're in the relationship to not fuel the passion, but to feed the relationship, right? right? Feed the relationship, not the passion part. Because he's saying, you know, he's giving us, okay, but if you're like this, you know, or if you have that desire to marry, then you should marry. Uh, But, you know, the passion part is saying, hey, listen, though, it doesn't give an excuse to just be like, I'm just gonna, I burn with passion and that's me. And then I'm just going to be that way, <laughs> you know? He's like, you should get married. That's a good thing to do if you're like that. But I think it's also on us to say, okay, but what are the things that I can put in place where I'm not going to feed the passion, I'm going to feed the relationship part? Because that's the thing that's going to endure. Um, and, to, you know, that includes, like, putting those healthy boundaries. Like, what are you watching that's going to feed the passion that's not a good idea? Reading. What are you, even what are you guys talking about in the context of your relationship? Like, there were some things that Eddie and I, once we were engaged, I think, we were like, we probably shouldn't talk about this right. anymore or right now. <laughs> you know, because it's only going to, it's only fueling the flame, you know, inside of us. And that's exactly why, um, you know, I've recommended to so many guys as they talk to me about this season. I talk about how you need to create a master plan for your physical relationship. Here's what that means. You gotta kinda think big picture here. (laughs) Normally with physical, the physical side of any relationship, you're not really thinking, you're just reacting to the, you know, an urge you had in the moment, and that's just not the best way to live your life in general. Um, And so that's why I recommend coming up with a master plan. Here's what that means. When you start dating, like start thinking about, if we, you know, I asked this girl out, we're dating, then she's my girlfriend, Okay, when, do, when if, if all goes well, when would we get engaged? Somewhere around here. And then if we got engaged then, where would we get married? Somewhere around there. Again, just estimating. Then you gotta think, okay, so how far away is that day? And am I being wise in how I'm building this physical relationship? Does that make sense? That you're kind of like basically choosing to pace things out. So, you know, Christina already mentioned, like we didn't kiss until a year after we started dating. That wasn't because some verse in the Bible told me to. That wasn't, no one told me I had to do that. That was simply me deciding, okay, if I can make it to that one-year mark and we can develop a a deep connection and a friendship that's grown and then a relationship, and then we can, you know, now have that expression at a year, then I knew I was going to have a better chance at making it to marriage from that point, and we did, and praise God, that, that was a helpful thing. And so I just encourage you guys, like, think big picture. Don't just think in the moment what I feel right now in this, you know, at this date. Think... Big picture, like what are the boundaries? Because the boundaries are to help you win. That's what we want. We want to make it to the finish line and, um, and not have to deal with anything, no baggage in our past. So that's why I think making a, a kind of a master plan makes sense so that you can flee that sexual temptation during that season. Right. And one of the illustrations I like to give people is that like in our nature as humans, we ha- we're like, I mean, we're more parts than this, but I like to think of it relationally like a braid, like if you think of three strands in a braid, we have our spiritual person, our emotional person, and our physical person. So when you have a braid like that in the relationship, um, putting the physical boundary helps you not to be pulling this part of the strand of the braid, you know, faster than the others. And likewise, um, especially in like the Christian context, it's really easy to be like, oh, hey, okay, I have all these awesome boundaries. We're not crossing these lines physically, but like we're super spiritual. We wanna be reading the Bible every day together. We wanna do all our devotions. We're praying about all these things or, you know, we're super really emotionally close. You know, we've shared our deepest, darkest secrets. We're like each other's accountabilities and all this stuff. And the problem is if you start to pull the spiritual strand also quicker and make those leaps before you're ready to as a couple or you pull the emotional strand, you're just waiting for the physical thing to catch up. Because if you're that close emotionally and spiritually, you're gonna fall into that trap physically as well, even though you think, oh, it's in the context of we're trying to be healthy and maybe these other areas. So um, just to make the point that the boundaries aren't just physical, it's your whole person, it's your whole part of the relationship of how you interact is to just have healthy things that are, like Eddie said, that are helps towards just being a, you know, a, a godly couple, people that are gonna honor the Lord in the whole journey. Right. That, that's just good. If you didn't write that down, you need to write that down. 
That is so practical and helpful because, yes, especially inside the church, we go too far on the spiritual side. It's like, right, yeah, you right. know, I won't hold her hand, but she knows my deepest, darkest secrets. Like, well, maybe there's something a little bit more in the middle of both those things. Um, also, that's a little misleading in yeah. relationship, just, <laughs> yeah. again, on the yeah. clarity Yeah, point. mixed signals for sure. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, the goal would be one step at a time in all three of those areas. Okay, one step at a time. No leaps and bounds in any three of those, any of those three areas. Just one step at a time. I think that's a really helpful way of viewing it. All right, so we recommend shorter engagements for those reasons. Um, second, we, uh, we want to make sure that we're staying alert all the way till marriage. Once you enter into the engagement pro- uh, process, you will find that there's just this feeling of like, well, I mean, it's her. It's going to be him. So then you know, you can let your guard down. You can stop being alert. And that can be both um, in the negative and in the positive things. You're missing out on, on the positive things as well as giving in to some negative things. And we don't want that for you. And it, it is a bit bizarre what happens because honestly, like, let's just, let's just shoot straight here. What would be sin on a Friday night, 24 hours later is suddenly beautiful and awesome in God's sight. Okay, and that's quite the turnaround there, right? And from one day to another, what is a boundary that you cannot cross to honor God suddenly is something that he blesses once the covenant is formed. When you stand before God and men and you say, we are committed for life, one flesh. I'm leaving my family. You're leaving your family. We are forming a new family. And we make that covenant before God himself. Once that happens, then he blesses. This And so you need to stay alert all the way till marriage. Any time you think you're not going to fall, that's when you really got to watch out. And that's why the scripture says, like, you got to be alert at all times and even more so during the engagement process. But you also could miss out on the beautiful things about the season if you're not alert, if you're not staying awake during this season. And uh, it's actually a really beautiful season. And I always encourage people, like, don't get so stressed out with this you know, wedding planning stuff that you don't even have memories from your engagement. It's so important that you're finding ways to make memories and do fun things that you will remember for the rest of your life. You know, Christina and I, we did some trips like while we were dating with friends, um, just little road trips. But the one I remember the most was the one we took when we were engaged. We went to Florida with a couple, a few friends. And, uh, And it's just like one of the sweetest memories. And it's how I remember our engagement, really. If you're like, hey, what was it like? I just remember that trip. because we made some memories together. And so I just want to make sure you're staying alert and just stay focused on the relationship. Yes, on the protecting, the boundaries, all those things, but also on the good stuff. Like make sure you're making memories together uh, as you go through engagement. Right. One of the things Eddie mentioned, we were um, engaged for three months. So 91 days, exactly. And so what I did was I bought um, uh, one of those moleskin journals, you know, and uh, I've n- titled it like 91 Days Till Marriage because it was exactly what, like Eddie said, engagement is such a unique season because you're like way more committed than you ever were in dating, but you're not married yet and you're not in covenant yet. And there's so many awesome things that like are just so unique to that season and I didn't want to miss any of them. And so I just took that journal and I just wrote down like one or two sentences of something that happened every day for all the 91 days. And then um, I gave it to Eddie the night before our wedding. And then like we have, so he looked through it that night, but like we have it now to look back on and think, look at that season, you know? And I'm, and praise God it was short because that was awesome, (laughs) you know? But um, I think it's a great idea to just do what you can to, like Eddie said, just stay alert, enjoying it and stay alert to be guarding yourself still. Oh yeah, I'm next. Okay. (laughs) And the last point for engagement that we have is exactly what Eddie was just um, hinting at. Don't let the pressures of a wedding get between you as a couple. Um, And I know that like we're talking to a majority of people that are not in this season, but we're trying to just share these things now so they're in the back of your mind or if you are in this season, it's helpful. Um, But this is a really important thing because the main point is to get married. Like the main point of this whole process, planning a wedding, being engaged, is to get you to say I do to each other and start your life together. And it can be so stressful if you choose to do, you know, more of the traditional route and you're having all these people and all that stuff. And I just commend to you, like, there's nothing that's going to be worth ruining that season or making that a super stressful time. It's just not worth it. Like if you're by nature, a person who's going to be easily stressed out, maybe just choose to not do the big thing, period. 
if you're a person that can handle it, but you are finding yourselves like in tension and fighting all the time about stuff, you gotta change something. Um, because like when we were planning ours, we had, you know, classic like people were asking us, friends or family that like couldn't make the date we set and they're like, can you change the date? And it's like, well, how many times do we change the date you know, to appease all the people, like, we just want to get married. <laughs> and so we made that choice, and, and it was a conversation toward unity of, like, we're already starting the process of becoming our separate own family, and sorry if you can't be there, but this is what we're going to do because we just want to get married. So um, just don't let those things get in the way of, you know, enjoying the season. It's really great. All right, so that's the last part of the journey towards marriage is engagement. Now let's talk about the first part, which is dating. The first part of this journey, which is dating, and uh, <laughs> man, we could, uh, we could spend a lot of time on this, but here, here are the three things we wanted to share with you guys about dating, and the first is we date to cultivate patterns of marriage. This is a really important sentence. We date to cultivate patterns of marriage. Now, if I could boil down the whole point of this series, it'd be that sentence right there. We date to cultivate patterns of marriage. The reason why we did everything in the order we did is because of that sentence. What, what my heart is for you is that you would see what marriage is and what God created it to be, and then that would help you as you date. Because as you, then you start dating, you say, what do I need to see? What, are I, what am I aiming for? You have a better sense of what you're aiming for, the better you can know if this is a good relationship for you. Because um, if you get, you know, staring at other things, other sets of values, other hierarchies of things that are good or bad, then you're going to get confused. But if you're looking at what God said, this is what it should be, that's going to help you. So inside of dating, we want to cultivate patterns of marriage. So what are those patterns? Well, um, if you remember when we talked about this in Ephesians chapter 5, I talked about how husbands are to have a role where in Genesis 2, we learned about what marriage is and how Marriage is a picture of Christ in the church, but then in Ephesians 5, what's newly revealed through this mystery that Paul shares in Ephesians 5 is that Christ in the church is a picture of marriage. And so what's the new information there is that he's showing us that the role of the husband uh, is that he's going to kind of take the role of Jesus in the fact that Jesus pursues the church. Jesus leaves heaven, he leaves his father, and he comes to earth, and he comes for his church. He's the one who pursues it. And we've studied how the head, you know, the husband is the head of the wife is what Paul talks about, but we've asked the question, but in what way? Like, what does that mean that he's the head? What does it mean that he's the leader? And that's where I gave all my scriptural support for he's the leader in the sense that he's the pursuer. He's the initiator. He's kind of the, the foundation of the relationship. He gets it going. And that is massively important in how it shows up in dating. So that's the biblical principle. And I should be seeing evidence of that already inside of dating. Now, when we apply this to dating, I don't mean it super like insanely strict in, in such a way that like, you know, if you're a girl, you're like, well, I can't you know, I can't pursue, so I literally, I can't do anything. I just have to like sit here and hope some pursuer shows up someday. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't go all the way to that point, but you know, you can make yourself known. There's all these things that you can do, but early on in the relationship, you need to see that he's gonna pursue you. You need to see that part of him because if he's not at a place where he's ready to take the role of the initiator, of the pursuer, man, you're in big trouble once it gets to married days. Uh, that is not going to get any better. It only gets worse. And that's why it's so important that this is what it means. We're cultivating principles of marriage inside of dating. So we're going to get a little taste of what is it going to be like if we were married. If you can see that he is pursuing you inside of the dating relationship. Yeah. And for the ladies, when we think about cultivating the patterns of marriage, I think that we have a really tricky position sometimes because I've had this conversation with actually several of friends here in NLYA already about how there's a lot of waiting like waiting is kind of like a big theme and that I think that's true of believers in general but it is especially for women I think because of that is because we want to see the, the pursuing you know towards us and we have to wait on that before we're not going to jump in and I think the tricky seat we have is if you lean in too much and are too forward because it's hard to wait and it's hard to see and wait for the fruit of the pursuit and all of that, 
then sometimes we communicate things by ourselves we don't mean to because that's not really who we are, but we just really want this to happen and it's really hard to wait. Um, but mainly if we're playing too hard to get or waiting too far back and like Eddie said, just kind of like back here and we don't show interest and we don't let the guy that we like or you know the people that we're interested in know that that is the case, then we might lose that opportunity altogether because they're not gonna know. And like Eddie shared with me, it's really tough. Like you talked about hiding in the bushes. Like it's, <laughs> it's hard to ask a girl out. It takes a lot of courage because it, no matter how confident you are that she's gonna say yes, there's always the chance that she's gonna say no. And that's really difficult. And so for us as women, the more that we can help it not be so much a shot in the dark and be like, okay, well, I think I'm kind of on the bullseye that if I were to ask her, she probably would say yes. Like that's a really, a really beneficial thing. Um, and I think that really, like that seat that we have is, um, it is waiting, but honestly, it's a great space when we think about cultivating patterns of marriage to cultivate discernment and to already have that building up in us as women to say, hey, how am I gonna respond to that? Like, maybe it is an opportunity for me to show my interest more, or maybe it's an opportunity for me to let him lead and let him pursue me so that I can see like where we're at in the relationship and I can kind of see the fruit of the man that he is. Um, and like when Eddie and I were dating, um, one of the times that that happened, well, before we were dating, like you said, we started dating in December and it was like right before Christmas break. Um, we had like, I knew that he was interested in me, uh, but I was going home. So I was passing through the state where he was working at a church that particular weekend. And I was passing right by the exit where he was gonna be. And I had this moment in the car. I'm like on the way home, driving back to, I was, we were living in Mississippi at the time. And I was like, oh, like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to be that girl that like calls and is like super forward, but also like, I know that he likes me and I'm right here. Like, can, and the Lord was like, can you just like be normal? Like, just be normal about this. It's really not that big of a deal. Like he's a normal person. You're a normal person. Like just call him, you know? So I called him and uh, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm literally like going to be at the exit for where you are right now. I know it's kind of creepy, but I'm right here. Like if you want to get lunch, you know? And he was like, yeah. And it was like one of my, our best, like our favorite memories. And he said that helped him so much because then he was like, oh yeah, like it's probably in the bag. Like, I, you know, we're, I think we're going today <laughs> because I showed interest. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I had been very clear, you know, in the first date right. or two. Right. And then that was like where I was like, okay, yes, she yeah. is for sure interested in me. Yes. Um, and it was at a Bojangles for what it's worth, which yes. is a very magical place. If you've yes. never been to Bojangles. You should <laughs> go there preaching. in the South. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Okay, so we date to cultivate the patterns of marriage. Second, this is a big one. We date with clarity of intention. We date with clarity of intention. All right, I'm going to stand up for this one. Here we go. <laughs> stand, up. stand up. Okay, this one's a big one for me. <laughs> um <laughs> It is, it is one of the most annoying things to me that like we have so many headaches when it comes to dating and relationships around this specific point because there's no clarity of intention. And I think, I mean, there could be many reasons why this is happening, but I just think some people, they want to lower the risk so far down that like I, there's no chance I'll get hurt. And so you make it this ambiguous relationship. And the problem with that is that a relationship can't grow in ambiguous soil. So you have to give it clear chance of growth by being clear in your intention. So when we were at Liberty, there was this term, and I don't even know if the youths speak it in this way today, <laughs> but uh, they used to talk about like, oh, I'm not dating that girl, I'm talking with her. Is that still said today? Ugh, gag. Oh, oh, that's terrible. Lord, may it die. <laughs> um, but it's like, when someone told me that, I was like, what, what does that mean? Like, you're talking to, like, we talk to a ton of people. What does that mean to you, you know? And uh, it was kind of this form of predating something. I don't know. But it was just another way. Again, I think it was a way to lower the risks. There was just too much fear, not enough courage to be able to say, like, we're going to have clarity of intention. And so I am very against anything that's ambiguous because I believe that it's absolutely appropriate amount of risk to ask someone out on a date. And so... If you're going to ask someone out, just please use that word date, please. So don't say, hey, do you want to hang out? Don't say, hey, could, you know, can I get your number just so we could connect later? Like that is the most businessy way of asking someone out. 
Um, do not do that. Use the word date. It's not that hard. So you say, hi, I'd like to take you out on a date. Could we go out for dinner sometime? There it is. I just handed it to you. Now, here's the benefit of that. That There's no way a girl can listen to that invitation and say, oh, I just, I wonder what that's about. You know, like, it is clear at that point that his intention is to say, we're going to go out on dates and we're going to discover if we want, if, you know, if more can come of this relationship. And so I think we see both things inside of the church where it's like way too much pressure to go out on a date. It's like once you go on a first date, it's like, whoa, I, now they're going to have beautiful children. Like, what? <laughs> way too intense, okay? Date number one should not feel like that. It's just asking someone on a date. But it also shouldn't be the opposite where it's just like, who knows? Maybe it is, maybe, no. It should be very, very clear that it is a date, and that's why you're asking that person out on a date. Okay, so use the word date and um, clarity of intention all the way through the relationship. When I, so the way I see it best is you ask someone out on a date, you go out on dates until you're ready to say, let's commit to this relationship, let's become boyfriend and girlfriend. And that's what I did with Christine. After a few dates, I was like, officially, I said, hey, do you want to be my girlfriend? I, and she was like, yes. And then we were like so excited, had a great time. And then the next day, we hung out and I was like, hey, by the way, um, let's talk about what it means to you that I'm your boyfriend and what it means to me that you're my girlfriend. Let's have an understanding of this is what, it, this is what we just said yes to. Like, we're like so excited to be officially dating, but we had to bring clarity to the intention. And so for us, once we said boyfriend and girlfriend, that means officially today, and we talked about that. That was a year and three months before we got married, and on that day, we talked about how the purpose of dating is to find out if we should get married. That's why we're dating each other. We're gonna find out if we're dating, and, or if we're gonna get married, and we don't know how long that's gonna take at the time, but it was clear from day one that our intention was to discover if this was the person that God had for us. All right, yeah. I feel better standing up after Good that. job, all good right. job. Yeah, and I will just say... <laughs> To all the men in the room, like speaking as the woman who was a part of that, you know, pursuit of that clarity, that may feel like a really weird and awkward thing to do to be like, hey, we're going to like, you know, what does that mean? And I just can't tell you the life that gives to a woman to be like, all right, like this is where we're going. Like it just shows, it's like, it might feel weird to start that conversation, but it, it like just goes super far. So well done, Eddie. <laughs> Thank you. It worked out for me pretty well. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, one, we both are going to share like a story. Uh, so I'm going to share a story of like a lack of clarity that I experienced. Um, when I was at Liberty also, uh, I had been friends with a guy um, for a while and we were really good friends. We hung out in a really like great group of people and, um, and I was very interested in him and it was like kind of slowly him showing that he was interested in me as well, like through various things, hanging out and different stuff like that. And I was like, I think, I feel like this is kind of going this way, but there was like never anything said, no clarity ever brought. So it was all me trying to figure it out on my side of things. Um, and to the point where like he asked me to go to this banquet together. So we like dressed up and did like a double date, but it was like not called a date. It was, you know, just one of those like very, boo. boo. <laughs> See, yeah, use the word date. <laughs> Um, but I really think he was trying to figure out where he was at, you know, to give grace to him. I think he was trying to figure out, do I want to date her? Do I not want to? We're really good friends. We've hung out for a couple years. Do I want to or not? And he just like could not figure it out in the time of that school year. We like hung out all the time and all this stuff. And then we get to the summertime and we talked on the phone a couple times and then it was just total dissolving of any communication, totally gone. And then the fall, we come back, kick off the year with all, we were all in the leadership at uh, Liberty, and then like a few months in, he started dating this girl. And I thought, well, I think that's my answer <laughs> because now he's dating somebody else. Um, and it was just so frustrating because there was no clarity. It was always wondering, well, gosh, how, I mean, what does he really think about me? If he's spending this time, he's communicating something, but yet he's not being clear about how he feels about me. I don't really know where we stand, but I'm developing this relation, this, these uh, feelings in the relationship, and that's only continuing to grow the more we hang out. And it was very confusing and very frustrating, and that is not the win at all. So the reason clarity is so helpful, as hard as it is, is because it helps give respect, give honor, um, give space to the other person to sort out their feelings in the meantime. Even if you're not sure, like this guy, like he, 
maybe he was just trying to figure out. I knew where I stood. We never had the conversation. But if you're trying to figure it out, you need to at least communicate that and bring some clarity because it's not fair to the other person to be on that journey with you as you're just pulling them along and you guys are trying to figure it out, but nothing's ever been said. So clarity is really important. And I'll just say it this way, and it might come across a little harsh, but hear me, like it's because I love you guys. You need to hear that if you're not ready for clarity, you're not ready for dating. Right. Those things go together. If you're like, oh, I don't know if I can handle that. That's totally fine. Just don't date right now. Like you're not ready yet. If you can't handle clarifying a, a simple dating relationship, whoo, wait till you get into a, the more serious parts of a relationship where you have to bring clarity to much, much more complex things, okay? So it only gets harder. <laughs> That's the great news. It only gets harder from here. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true. So if, if you're not ready for that clarity, you're definitely not ready to be dating. All right, last thing we wanted to share is that we date with mutual respect. It's a mutual respect. Now this is something that, almost should go without saying, but this is just Christian behavior, period. Let alone, of course, it has to apply within dating, but uh, this is the way we should be treating one another with mutual respect, and that shows up in the fact that if someone asks you out, and let's say you're not interested, the way you show that person respect is by saying, I'm not interested in that. That is the best way you can show someone respect, because I've seen it happen to people who I love, and it's like, you know, one of my friends, he asked this girl out, and then she's like, um, I don't know, let me think about it. And then it's like weak and weak, and then he followed up and followed up, and I just had to look at him, and I was like, bro, I just, dude, I don't think she's interested. <laughs> I mean, it's been two months, and nothing's happened. I think she's trying to say no, but it was, it was just so sad to see this in my friend that that took everything in him to ask her out, and I just think a mutual respect in return to that would just be, just be honest. If you're not interested in going on a date, guess what you get to say? No, I, I, I don't wanna go on that date. <laughs> And that's okay, and that, that's what mutual respect shows up like inside, inside of dating, and you each have to communicate in the relationship. Let's say you are dating. The mutual respect shows up in not one of you having to own everything. You both are expressing what you're experiencing, how you feel about things, and bringing up topics that are necessary. That's where it becomes mutual inside of the respect, and um, you know, I mentioned that friend from high school who I took out on f- a, s- a few dates, and then I dated Christina, but there was this one girl uh, that I took out on one date in between both those situations, and I actually don't remember when I asked her out, but I said, you know, can we go out on a date? I'll take you to Olive Garden, because it was very fancy, <laughs> very fancy. <laughs> um, so we went to Olive Garden, and I, you know, it went, it went perfectly fine, we just Got, I got to know her, she got to know me, and then at the end of the date, I said, I had a great time, would you like to go out on a second date? And she said, yes, I would, I had a great time too. And then what happened next is that she ghosted me. And I gotta explain to Pastor Brad what that means still, but... Um, <laughs> So she literally just disappeared from my life. And, and the problem with that is that she had already agreed to a second date. So like literally the next day, she's avoiding me. I never talked to her the next day. And then I texted her the third day. I was like, hey, you know, I just wanted to follow up. Would love to take you out on the second date. And silence, you know, just crickets, like nothing. And I was like, no, you, I, don't, I don't think I'm gonna allow this to happen. And this is because because again, I, I believe in this mutual respect inside of relationships. So what I did is I ended up seeing her a week after she had agreed to a second date. And I saw her and then I just walked straight up to her and I was like, look, listen, everything's okay. <laughs> um, but I, like, I asked you out on a second date, you said yes. And so I think what you, what you owe me is just simply saying that you would rather not go on that second date. I don't think that's too much to ask. And she was like so like nervous about it. And she was like, yeah, I, I don't think I wanna go out on the second date. And I was like, thank you. Like, that's, that's it. I will never bother you. I'm not gonna be a stalker, I promise. I'm gonna respect you, but I need you to respect me too. Because it took a lot of energy on my part to bring that clarity, and you need to be mut- bring that mutual respect, okay? So just think of it as a two-way street when it comes to these things. That yes, we're gonna try to have a pursuing, you know, the man is gonna pursue the woman, but there needs to be mutual respect inside of that relationship. Um, it's really, really important. So, so that's it. And inside of dating, we date to cultivate patterns of marriage. We date 
with clarity of intention and we date with mutual respect. Man, if you got those three things, I think you're doing pretty good. Um, I think that will set you guys on a really great path. And, uh, and so just to close, here, here's the thing. <sighs> Going through these, this journey that we're talking about here tonight, it, it's not always fun. It's not always exciting. There are some like really, really difficult parts of going through the journey of dating and being engaged. And so our encouragement to you guys is that you would invite a small group of trusted people into this area of your life. You shouldn't be making these decisions alone. You shouldn't be evaluating how the date went alone. You need to find people who can, you know, kind of give you some feedback of like, tell me how it went, and then I can kind of listen in And the reason that's really important is because sometimes your trusted group of friends are gonna be able to catch the red flags before you do. Sometimes, because they don't have, you know, as much of an interest in the person as you do. You're the one going on dates. And they can see things like, yeah, that's not great. That's not great. And you're like, oh, but it was such a beautiful restaurant. You're like, yeah, that has nothing to do with the, that's nothing to do with the person. (laughs) Like, this is not a good thing. And and we need that. Like, we need those people in our lives. That's why there's wisdom in the multitude of counselors. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so, um, so make sure you're inviting a small group of trusted friends into that space and make sure you're inviting the Lord into every step of this journey. Every single step. And I think what you guys, as you've been coming here through this whole summer, and it's been a series on dating and marriage, for some of you are like, oh yeah, I'm ready to learn about that. For many of you, it's been difficult. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready for this, but can I just commend you? If, if you've been here, like that's how you're inviting the Lord into this space in your life. And so if you feel that bit of discomfort, that might not be a bad thing. That might be the Lord saying, I gotta bump a few things out of the way so that I can be invited into this space, so that I can make room for you as we've been singing. And so invite the Lord into every step of the journey, the exciting parts, the disappointment. Invite him into the confusion, the frustration. Invite him into the fun parts, the new parts, and the waiting. Invite him into all those things. Because this really is a complicated subject, and it is complicated. But if you invite the Lord into this space, and if you invite a small group of trusted friends, what is super complicated can become less complicated for you. Maybe not in circumstance. I can't predict your future. I don't know how it's all going to turn out. It might end up being complex. But maybe not in circumstance, but it, it will be less complicated in your direction in your confidence in knowing what is happening in your life, and you can be clear in the sense of your direction. I know what I'm aiming for, and I know that if I, if I obey what God has said, if I submit to his will in this way, the, you know what's on the other side of that is your joy. It's good things for you. This is God's heart for you. He wants to bless you in this area. He's not wanting to be, it to be a torture in your life. It's, it's something good that he desires for you. So uh, Christina's gonna pray for us and then we are going to uh, just spend some time in the presence of God. And I, I just wanna invite you, think about those two things I just said, inviting a small group of trusted friends and evaluate right now. Do you have that? Um, and if you don't have that, how could you start aiming towards having that? And then in what ways have you not invited the Lord into this space yet? And what are the things that you can do to say, Lord, I need you in this part, this part of my life. I need you in this way specifically. Um, so just think about those two things uh, as we pray and then also as we worship the Lord after we pray. So Christina, lead us in prayer and then we'll sing together. If you guys could just put your hands out in front of you as we pray, just to invite the Lord in to this moment. Um, Father, we just come before you right now and we just recognize our great need for you We recognize our great need for a savior because we're so broken. And in that brokenness, the first thing it directly affects is our relationships, how we interact with each other, how we view ourselves at times. And Father, we just wanna come right now before you as we've talked about these things with dating and engagement. And Father, we just wanna submit them to you. We wanna come with open hands to say, we want what you want, Lord. And Father, we want the things that you speak about in your word, Lord. We want to have a relationship that's gonna be, uh, bring mutual respect. We wanna have good communication. Lord, we want it to be something that's gonna cultivate the things that you give us the image of, of marriage. 
And so, Lord, as we've talked about these things, Lord, I just, I just know that there's a gamut of where the hearts are at in the room, and God, only you see them. Only you see them, and you see them, God. Father, I pray that for those that in this time this has brought excitement and anticipation because they're early on in dating or they're engaged or they're just an exciting point in this journey that we're talking about. Father, I pray that you would um, give them so much joy that you would let the things that are growing that are of you deepen and the things that are things you would have removed that you would begin to take those out in your gentle and awesomely kind way, Lord, that leads us to repentance. Father, for those in the room that this is a really vulnerable, difficult topic for a myriad of reasons, Lord, I pray that you would remind them in this moment right now, Father, that you see them, you know them, you have seen all the things that they've walked through, you know all the things that are going on in their heart and their mind right now, and Spirit, I pray comfort over them. God, I pray that you would give them great counsel as you are a counselor, Holy Spirit. And God, I just pray Isaiah 42, 16 over them, God, that the darkness before them, would you would change it to light and the rough places that are before them, you would make level ground because these are the things you do and you do not forsake them. God, would it be things that come out of this season for these people in this room, God, that would bring so much fruit and so much glory for your sake. God, we pray and believe that there are gonna be marriages that are birthed out of this room that are gonna be beautiful pictures of Christ and the church. They're gonna be a light in this world. And I pray that you would start that process right even now. For the person who has never dated in their life, for the person that has a broken, uh, baggagey background, Lord, that you redeem that you will bring light out of this. And God, that you would just give hope for the future, Lord, because that's what you promised, Lord. You give us a future of hope. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would have your way in these lives that are here, Lord, these friends of ours that have come. God, that it would be your words that are ringing in their ears, that it would be your word that is stirring up their heart this week, that the things that Eddie and I have shared, Lord, the things that would be exhortation, encouragement, um, would be uh, the things that, that would help them, Lord, would you let those things remain and let everything else fall to the ground. God, that what leaves this room is the things that are gonna be producing the fruit that you want in these lives. God, you are so faithful to us. I thank you for the testimony, Lord, of that you've given Eddie and I, that though we are far from perfect and you have so much work left to do for us, God, we thank you that we could share our story and I thank you, God, because you're the one that wrote it and you're writing all the stories in this room. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to write them with your awesome penmanship and that all of the hearts in this room would know the author more intimately today and this week and this year than they've ever known in their life, that they would know you with so much love and truth and that you would give them the capacity to understand how much you love them and what you have for them in this life. God, for your glory. Thank you for this time that we've spent in this place. We come to you in worship for you are worthy, Lord. We pray that you would stir our hearts right now to continue to worship you as we know that you are over all things. You are in all things, Lord, and we could bring all things under submission to you for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
God is still standing. God is still speaking. God is still moving and God is still working. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Are you alive to that? And I hope you're hearing what he's saying through his word and through his people. Uh, looking forward to uh, another week. We still have another week in the series. We'll be addressing some of the questions you guys sent in today. We'll see you on Tuesday night, 7 o'clock, same time, same place. And uh, don't forget, if you want to go to Elitch Gardens, tonight is the night to sign up. This is it. This is the deadline. All right, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>